Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Integrative Practitioner Podcast, your on-the-go resource where we bring you closer to top industry experts through exclusive interviews with leaders in integrated medicine. I'm Katherine Rushlow, editor of Integrative Practitioner, and today we're talking about mast cell activation syndrome. This episode is brought to you in part by the Integrative Healthcare Symposium. This September 18th through 20th, 2021, Practitioners from across disciplines will gather in person for three days of education, inspiration, and connections in New York City. Conference topics will focus on wellness and mental health, COVID-19 care and recovery, and diversity, equity, and inclusion in the healthcare field. And all learning opportunities offer practical insights and techniques that can be immediately incorporated into your patient practice. Use code PODCAST21 to save 15% on a standard conference pass. That's P-O-D-C-A-S-T-2-1. That'll save you 15% off of a standard conference pass. Please visit www.ihsymposium.com slash register for more information. We're so happy to have you as part of this community of integrative healthcare professionals. If you're interested in learning more about our membership offerings, and how you can get access to exclusive content and networking opportunities, please visit integrativepractitioner.com slash join. For today's podcast, I'm joined by Dr. Tanya Dempsey. Dr. Dempsey is the founder of the AIM Center for Personalized Medicine, a destination practice in Purchase, New York, focusing on complex multi-system diseases. Dr. Dempsey, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me. At the upcoming Integrative Healthcare Symposium, you're going to be presenting a session on mast cell activation syndrome. But before we get into that discussion, could you tell us a little bit about yourself and how you became interested in this topic? Yeah, thanks uh, for starting that way. I'd I'd like to just give a little background then, I guess. You know, I've been in the integrative world for over 10 years now, probably 11 or 12 years. And, you know, when I, before I went into integrative medicine, one of the things that frustrated me the most was, you know, I was doing internal medicine, general medicine. I was treating a lot of patients that had lots of uh, chronic, long-term complex diseases that no one really could figure out. And I felt compelled to help these patients, but I couldn't because I didn't have the, the means. I didn't have the, I didn't have the time in a traditional medical model, but I also just didn't have didn't have an understanding of all the complexity of like what could be going on, right? The root causes of things. And when I slowly evolved into integrative medicine, which is really what I've been doing actually for my whole career, but didn't really know that um, until someone really told me that really my way of thinking about things was really integrative. Um, once I started to uh, see these complex patients in a different way and started to understand how much I had to dig and get to the root causes, the more I understood. The more you understand, the, actually, the less you know. <laughs> so then I had to dig even deeper. And really, somewhere around, uh, probably at this point, about eight years ago, seven or eight years ago, I had a patient that, that through a lot of research uh, on her end and on my end, we figured out had mast cell activation syndrome. So she's my the first patient that I ever identified this syndrome in. And once you see it in one patient, you can't unsee it. And you see it really in many, many patients. And it became very clear that, that many of those patients with, with complex, chronic, multi-system diseases had mast cell activation syndrome as either the root or one of the roots of their condition. And then the rest is history at this point, because uh, again, the more we dig into this, the more we, we see the real, the co- real complexity behind this. Absolutely. And for our audience members that might not be completely familiar with what mast cell activation syndrome means, could you quickly define it and how it really impacts the patient and the body as a whole? Sure. So mast cell activation syndrome is a, it's a syndrome, right? So syndromes uh, are, are more difficult to diagnose. There's a spectrum of disease. But really, the, the root of mast cell activation syndrome is an abnormality in the part of the immune system. And I think 
the way to think about it is that, you know, we have different parts of the immune system. They have different jobs. They work in concert together. There's one particular part of the immune system. It's called the innate immune system. It's really the primitive immune system that um, is first to attack the various things that we come in contact with uh, in the environment. So the different parts of the immune system deal with uh, acute attack, acute, it could be acute viruses, bacteria, but could be environmental triggers and poisons and toxins. The body has to have a way to, to interact with the environment. And so the front line to that is, is really a cell called the mast cell. And that mast cell is part of that innate immune system. It's the first thing that comes in contact with whatever is going on in the environment. That mast cell is a, is a white blood cell, um, essentially, and it lives in all the tissues in the body. We always think about white blood cells as, as living in the bloodstream um, after it's released from the bone marrow. But mast cells actually, after they're released from the bone marrow, kind of go into all the tissue. So it's the skin, it's the lungs, it's the heart, it's the stomach, it's the nervous system, anywhere where there's organs um, is where these mast cells are. And they're in places where they're in contact with the environment. Again, they are trying to protect us from our environment. So they're in that interface and they read the environment and, and react to the environment in different ways. So they can see a stimulus. It could be could be pollen if you're allergic to pollen. It could be a, a virus like COVID, something that, that the, the mast cell sees as foreign. It's going to do a few different things. The main thing that it does is it actually, it it makes uh, granules of of chemicals. Um, These chemicals are known as mediators. Um, Many, some of them are cytokines or they're interleukins, they're different enzymes. There are lots of things that these mast cells make. They uh, hold them in these granules and when they see an attack uh, or they see a stimulus, they attack essentially and they explode, degranulate and release these, um, these chemicals. And with the release of these chemicals, the job is to really to fight off whatever that stimulus is. But, but often, these chemicals are so inflammatory that when they come in contact with our own tissue, so again, the mast cells are in our tissues, are in our organs, and they release these chemicals. And unfortunately, what happens is then it actually backfires in a way and, and then affects and causes inflammation in our own body, in our own tissue and organs. So um, that's one way the mast cell works. It's, it's the easiest way to think of, but the mast cell also interacts with other parts of the immune system and also tells other cells to make antibodies, to do other things. The reality, though, is that everybody has mast cells and everybody has mast cells that will react in that way in response to certain stimuli. In mast cell activation syndrome, what we're talking about is we're talking about people who have abnormal mast cells. They're not just reacting to the things that are really bad for it. They're overreacting in general. They sort of forget. They sort of don't have the, the means to, to, to reset themselves. Normal person, let's say, gets the flu, gets an infection, gets a virus, their mast cells will react, but then will reset, go back to baseline and get ready for the next attack. But in mast cell activation syndrome or MCAS for short, the problem is that the mast cells don't really reset, and they just become more and more activated and more and more irregularly responsive um, over time. And so if you think about it, it makes a lot of sense to, as to why some patients have who are they're sick, they have multi-system involvement, multiple things in their body you know, are affected, why with time it seems like, like some of them continue to get worse. And it's because that over time, the mast cells become more and more dysregulated and causing and causes more and more damage. And, and then it's much harder to rein in. The key is to identify this as soon as possible so that you can, uh, you know, affect the long-term effects of this. It's certainly an area of interest, especially within the last years. The healthcare community is trying to develop a deeper understanding of the immune system. Can you talk about how mast cells impact things like autoimmunity and neuroinflammation. I know that is a a really core component of your talk. We interrupt this program to bring you a brief message from one of our sponsors. This episode is sponsored by Rupa Health. I know a lot of you out there are practitioners, helping patients heal using real food and integrative medicine as your framework for getting to the root cause. 
A big part of understanding what forms of support each individual body needs is testing, which is why I'm so excited to tell you about Rupa Health. Looking at hormones, organic acids, nutrient levels, inflammatory factors, gut bacteria, and so many other internal variables can help practitioners find the most effective path to optimize health and reverse disease. But up until now, that usually meant ordering tests for one patient from multiple labs. I'm sure many of you know how time consuming this process is and that it can all feel like a lot to keep track of. Now there's Rupa Health, a place for integrative medicine practitioners to access more than 2,000 specialty lab tests from over 20 labs like Dutch, Vibrant America, Genova, Great Plains, and more. Rupa Health helps provide a significantly better patient experience. It's 90% faster, letting you simplify the process of getting the integrative and functional tests you need and giving you more time to focus on patients. You can check out a free live demo with a Q&A or create an account at www.rupahealth.com. That's R-U-P-A health.com. Thank you once again to Rupa Health for supporting today's podcast. Now let's get back to the program. Yeah, and I'll obviously be, be digging deep into that. Uh, this is a very brief overview, right? But I think the, the things to think about is, you know, as I mentioned, mast cells are uh, not just the first line of defense, but they also interact with other parts of the immune system. And there's one part in particular, there's a, there are cells in the body, white blood cells that make antibodies. And mast cells have a way of presenting to these cells something called antigen. Antigen is like a protein. And that protein could come from a real infection, can come from a real toxin, can come from something, or in some cases could be a, we'll call it like a faulty antigen. It's not really there. Their infection is not there, but the mast cells see it and they have this protein and they're going to tell the antibodies, the the antibody producing cells, go ahead and make antibody to this. And, you know, the increase in antibody production is associated with autoimmunity. And so what, what we're seeing is that mast cells can cause the immune system either to correctly produce antibodies that are needed to fight off something or can incorrectly stimulate the immune system to make antibodies against different parts of the body, sort of attacking itself leading down this, this what looks like autoimmunity. And so whether mast cells are causing autoimmunity or whether they're involved in that process, we can't say for sure yet. The research is supporting its role in the development of what we call autoantibodies, but we don't know if those autoantibodies are actually doing something, actually attacking the body, or they're just there because the mast cells told them to be produced. It's very complex. But if we take it one step further, if the mast cells are telling the immune system make antibodies, and these antibodies are in fact attacking and causing inflammation, you know, imagine that happening at the level of the nervous system. And so, in the in the brain, in the in the nervous system as a whole, there are different cells that do different things. We have we have the neuron that's sending the signal, the electrical signal, but then we have other cells that are part of the immune system, and they're protecting the brain and the nervous system from assault, from, let's say, bacteria, viruses, toxins. And the mast cell interacts directly with these, these immune cells. And they have, a, they have a two-way street. It's a two-way street. So they'll send a signal to the mast cells. The mast cells will send a signal back. The signaling could be with different types of um, chemicals, neurotransmitters, various uh, cytokines. And that signal then can, you know, in a, in a way be good. So if there really is a virus and the body has to take care of it, there, is the, there are these signals, okay, these cells like uh, macrophages and neutrophils have to come into the site of the infection and help to fight off the infection. And the mast cells help with that. And those other cells, astrocytes and microglia help with that as well. But, and I have a really great slide to talk about this, so I, I'll definitely dig a little deeper into this at the conference. But again, some of what is happening is good. The problem is when it continues to happen, even 
when the infection or the stimulus is, is removed, right? So let's say something has been treated, but the immune system hasn't figured out. And it continues in this vicious cycle of inflammation. And then what, that, what happens there? The nerves are not functioning properly. I think about it as like the, the brain on fire. The cells in the brain cannot focus and work cor- correctly. It's sort of like, I use the analogy of a, of a wire. You know, if you have a plug, a you know, charger or whatever, and you have, you know, all those wires are, are coated with, a, with insulation, right? There's something that coats them so that the signal can go correctly. It, it's almost like you take that cord and you, you fray it. And now you, the signal doesn't go, right? The charger doesn't work anymore. You can't charge your iPhone because everything is damaged. And this is sort of the same thing. The signaling pathways are damaged, are affected. And then what does that do? It leads to neuropsychiatric diseases. It could be depression. It could be um, obsessive compulsive disorder or anxiety. It could be brain fog. It could be you know, a number of, of neurologic effects. I know you're going to go more in depth into this during your talk, but when it comes to treatment options, what are some that you're going to be discussing that integrative practitioners can either use in their practices or refer out to? Like, where would you begin? Well, you know, I I will emphasize in the talk uh, the need for testing. I think it's really important to uh, really identify the patients who, who truly have this. You know, sometimes, yeah, we can't get the answers, and sometimes it is worth treating patients empirically. I will say that because this is a complex syndrome with lots of overlying issues, and because in general the the medical community has not really accepted this as fully as it should, yes, it's been accepted in the integrative world, but not so much in the allopathic world. And so I think it's more important than ever to actually identify that this is the cause because then it makes more sense to go down the treatment pathways. I am going to talk about both conventional and and non-conventional and and more uh, natural therapies for this. But again, I I am going to go through the diagnostic criteria and really go through the the importance of, of really proving that the patient really that this explains most of what the patient's issue is or all of what the patient's issue is, because that is, I think, key in making and getting this accepted in the whole medical community. But having said that, you know, we are going to, I am going to focus on the two, two areas. One is going to be what I'll call pharmacologic MCAS treatment. So that's the more traditional drugs. Some of them are over the counter. We have uh, H1 blockers. Those are antihistamines. We have H2 blockers, and those are essentially antihistamines that work in the gut. And, and a number of other prescription uh, meds, some are compounded and, and some are commercially available. And there's a real ga- a gamut going from the simple over-the-counter to drugs that are even in the, considered chemotherapy agents for some diseases. And in the non-pharmacologic world, in the more natural sort of setting, we're going to talk about, we're going to, we'll talk about diet, we'll talk about some natural supplements that can be used that have natural antihistamine effects. They might have uh, uh, mast cell stabilizing effects. And we'll talk about just sort of looking at this from an integrative approach. So we're going to look at not just treating with these various agents, but also thinking about how this fits in as a whole to other things that are going on in the body. So if there's an imbalance in the gut, that has to be treated, not just from, a, from the mast cell perspective, but as, just looking at it as a whole, as to the, the immune system as a whole and the body as a whole. So I'm going to cover a lot of these pieces. I mean, one of, the, one of the areas that I see very frequently in my practice is the overlap between mast cell activation syndrome and, and mold exposure. And so eliminating the triggers like mold and mycotoxins or even infections like tick-borne infections is a very important component in the treatment overall of, of MCAS. We have a few more minutes on our time today. So I've been asking all of the speakers, what are you most looking forward to about presenting your session and attending the conference in general? Well, IHS is really, I think it's the first conference that I ever attended when I started going down the integrative path. So I have very fond memories of the speakers that I heard that year. I think Dr. Lombard, 
was one of the speakers. Dr. Hyman was one of the speakers, right? These are some of the, some of those early speakers that I saw, I don't know, 12 years ago or more at this point, you know, real uh, mentors, you know, real giants in this world and have, have, have done a lot for integrative medicine. So I'm so excited about just being there at this conference, but, but really honored to be now, you know, presenting my information and my, my work when, again, that's kind of where it all started. And I'm really excited because the work that I've been doing in the, in the MCAS world um, is just evolving constantly. And I'm learning every day from my patients. And I, I want to provide this information for others because I think it's been invaluable to me, my practice, my patients in understanding this. It's changed my practice. And I guess I want I want to change other practitioners' practices. I want, and, and ultimately, what does that do? It really changes patient care as a whole. So I'm, I'm, I'm really, um, really looking forward to sharing all this and, and, and changing the, the paradigm in medicine in a way. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Dempsey, for joining us on the podcast today. We've so enjoyed having you, learning a bit about you in your session. We look forward to seeing you at the conference in September. Thank you so much. I'm really looking forward to it. Thanks for listening. We'd like to thank Scott Holmes and Kevin McLeod for providing us with our theme music. Please be sure to visit our website, integrativepractitioner.com, or send us an email at ipeditor at divcom.com. Remember to like and subscribe to our show, and we'll see you next time.